Well, hello and welcome. My name is Vicki Gray. I am an assistant clinical professor for the School of Social Work here at the Robert Stemple College of Public Health and Social Work. We're gonna be talking about how to de-stress. In fact, the topic of this workshop is resetting so that we can stress less. And so if you are a student joining here in this conversation, um, perhaps you're in a season where you're experiencing a great deal of stress or we've been in a season of a lot of stress. So I just want you to use this time and get up from this presentation, whatever it is that you need. Perhaps before we begin, I would encourage you to grab something to write with, have a pen and paper nearby, a journal, um, take care of yourself in whatever way you need. So grab some water, grab a snack. We're gonna spend about the next 30 minutes or so at your pace kind of trying to personally and individually unpack um, what is stressing you out the most and then how maybe we can apply some new coping strategies and some new ways at attempting to mediate the stress in your life. So I'm looking forward to sharing some information with you and certainly hoping that it adds value. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm gonna put some slides up for you to follow along um, if that's what you'd like to do. I also wanna encourage you at any point that you need, you can um, pause the recording, um, you can take notes, you can write as thoughts come to mind. Just follow along at a pace that's really comfortable for you. Okay, so let me go ahead and put this in presenter mode. Here we go. All right, the very first thing that I want you to consider is where you are at right now as you are watching this recording. How exactly are you experiencing stress? To what degree, to what intensity? And so take a moment and look at the scale and you notice that the scaling goes from zero to 10. Zero totally relaxed, which for most of us, we experience some measure of stress um, in planning for a day and getting out and driving. So even if you're not necessarily at a nine or an eight, chances are you're somewhere from about a two on up. And so go ahead and plot yourself if you're in the middle of final exams, maybe you're experiencing or midterms or big assignments, maybe you're higher on the scale. If you have multiple conflicts or multiple demands placed on you, you work, maybe you're doing internship, attending school, all of these things together might also increase your stress level. So just note that right in this moment, where are you? And just kind of, write that number down somewhere. My hope is that at the end of our time here, that maybe we can bring it down a notch or two. And then with daily practice, hopefully you'll really see this number decrease over time. Now that you have kind of a number, go ahead and identify what is stressing you out the most. What is it that really drives that number higher for you? What is it that moves you from a four to an eight? Is it responsibilities, duties, people in your life, um, immediate pressures, pressures about the future, expectations you put on yourself, expectations others put on you? Take a moment and think about this. And if you want, you can even jot it down, make a list of the things that are stressing you out the most. Then once you have an idea of what those things are, now check in with yourself. How do you experience stress? How does stress affect you personally? We all experience stress in different ways. And so take a little inventory here and Recall the ways in which stress negatively affects you. And I also want to point out that stress doesn't only negatively affect us, it can positively affect us, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But how does stress affect you? 
Does it impact your sleeping, your eating habits, how well you care for yourself? What does it do to your thought process? What is your self-talk like? How does it impact your overall health? Do you get sick more often? Stomach aches, headaches? Do you have to miss class, call out from work? What's going on with you when stress is negatively affecting you? And then I want you to consider maybe some of the ways that stress positively impacts you. And for some of you listening to this, you might think, how on earth can stress be a positive thing in my life? Well, we know that there are times where stress is useful to us. Stress can actually send us signals um, that lead to better performance, higher performance, greater stamina, at least in the short term. And in that case, we might get a good result. Um, we might be, we might utilize stress because we have a big exam. And so we end up shifting and focusing on studying the material. So in that case, the stress kind of works for you, the stress of an upcoming exam. Okay, where it becomes harmful is when these become patterns for us. And over time, when these patterns now turn into just our way of being and our way of doing. And before long, our bodies can't sustain that level of stress response. So positively, stress can be helpful for us in the moment. We also know that stress can get us out of dangerous situations. When we experience maybe a threat or a stressful situation, that's kind of a positive signal to like get yourself out of there. Remove yourself from that situation into a safer um, space. So we, we want to acknowledge the fact that the stress has been around forever. Stress is something that will be around forever. In fact, we are hardwired and we are built to manage, to respond to stressors. It's just what happens when our stress levels are overdone. What happens when we're outside of the threshold to where we can comfortably manage stress? Well, what ends up happening for most of us is we experience it in internalizing ways. We feel it in our bodies and in externalizing ways. We eat more, we sleep more, or we don't sleep, we distract ourselves, um, we avert ourselves away from getting things done. Just notice the ways in which you internalize and externalize stress that's overdone. Now, it's important that we note here just for a moment that um, given the situation that we've all been in, we're now, as I'm recording this, we are now about, goodness, almost a year and half um, having dealt with COVID. And there has been a lot of shifting, a lot of changes that have had to take place during this time. Um, there's been a lot of direct and indirect consequences, a lot of fears, um, a lot of concern for our well-being and the well-being of others. So it's important to recognize that even if you've managed stress well in the past, given the sustained and heightened level of stress that we are all experiencing collectively, if you haven't already done so, it really is time to amp up your self-care strategies. This is the time to keep doing whatever you were doing, but then also adding more to it, really amping up or elevating how you care for yourself. And I want you to see this visual here of this bucket on the screen. And what this represents is kind of this invisible bucket that we all carry around with us, which is our capacity and our ability to manage stress well. Well, as you can see from this image, this bucket is pretty tattered. It looks pretty worn and not doing so great. And this bucket actually reflects maybe how we're feeling, how some of us have been coping with a year and a half plus of additional stressors above and beyond what would maybe be our normal stressors of school and work and life and family commitments. And so we have to imagine that if we are kind of responding to stress more, then we need to find ways to fill up that bucket, to keep refueling and refilling ourselves. So that as some of these events, these stressful events take a hit, or in this case, kind of poke a hole in our bucket, we're finding ways to continuously refill and kind of patch ourselves back up. So take a moment 
and maybe draw or think of what is the condition of your bucket? How does your bucket look given the stressors that you're carrying around? Now, when we think about what are the things that we can do to add to our bucket, to kind of add to our resourcing uh, for when we're stressed, we want you to really plan for success here, okay? Um, obviously, for the majority of people, you know, we kind of experience stressors at varying levels, and we may have a season in our life where we're less stressed and other seasons where we're experiencing greater stress. So in thinking about what is your plan for success now, I want you to ask yourself two questions. The first question is, what's currently working for me? What are you doing that is already helping you to manage stress, to cope, to provide self-care, to give back to you? What are you doing that's working? And note that somewhere. Okay, kind of write those things down. Remind yourself that those are the things that are working. Perhaps it's accessing social support, people in your life who care, invest, and pour into you. It might be um, some movement, some activity that you enjoy, walking, playing with a pet. Um, a lot of people got into new activities such as gardening, caring for plants, baking. What are the things that are working for you already? And this might be a little bit of a harder question to answer, but what do I need to do? What do I need to be adding to my coping toolkit? So what am I already doing and what's missing? What do I need to be including or adding into kind of my daily practice of managing stress? And for some of us, we know what that is. We've been thinking about this what we should be doing, right? Shoulds, although we don't want to put that on ourselves because that leads us to feel poorly about ourselves and can bring up self-shame. But we may have carried some thoughts with us already um, before me even posing this question to you about, well, I probably should, or it'd probably help me if I, what have you been thinking about? And if you haven't thought about that question and you really don't know, that's why you're here. I don't know. I just know that I need help and I need to add more. We're going to talk about it. Okay. So we want to kind of focus on what are the things that are within our control? So what are the things that we can control? And this is where we can take an action oriented approach. So what are some things that I can control? Maybe how much I study. Um, maybe how I spend my free time, maybe what I choose to focus on in terms of my self-talk. And then what is with, uh, what are the things that are not within your control? And for this, we have to shift our mindset to an acceptance oriented approach. So what are the things you can change and the things you actually are able to impact? And then what are the things that maybe I just need to accept? So maybe some things that you have to accept are things like COVID. We don't have much control. There are things that we can do to protect ourselves and to protect others, but this thing is still there. And we have, at some level, we've had to accept that this is a part of our reality. Okay, so there are things that are within our control that help maybe drive down a little bit of our stress. And then there are other things that feel like they're out of our control. But the way that we drive down that stress is by really practicing acceptance around it. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more in detail. So when we think about what's within our control, the action-oriented things that we can be focusing on, I want you to consider time management, thought management, and people management. Okay, so with respect to time management, um, good friend and colleague, Kelly Sidner, who um, also works here with me in the School of Social Work, is really interested in time management. In fact, um, she's working on her PhD, and this is her area of focus, of research focus. And she likes to engage people in an activity that she calls $24 for 24 hours. Basically, if you had $24 to spend, how would you spend it? And obviously, we only have 24 hours in a day. We can't get one minute more. So how you spend those 24 hours really matters. So our decision-making around time management really can 
uh, increase the stress that we feel or it can oftentimes decrease the stress that we feel. And so being kind of strategic around really evaluating your calendar. If you have never done this, I highly encourage you to maybe consider what would be a normal day if you have one of those, maybe where you attend school, maybe you attend work, you have to set aside time for studying, you have to set aside time for commuting, you have to set aside time for you and kind of map that out. How do you spend your time? Where do you spend those 24 hours? Because for many of us, we have hidden time. There's time that's actually in our schedules that we don't maximize or we're not prioritizing or we're not planning and it kind of is wasted and we could really convert that wasted time into time to refuel, to re-energize, to restore ourselves during stressful events. So one of the ways that we can do this is by connecting some new habits um, around times in our day that are like known. Recognize your knowns is what it's called. So the knowns are the things that all of us engage in um, on a regular basis. So you hopefully get some sleep every day. You should eat a certain number of meals a day. You engage in your own personal care and hygiene. Maybe you have work that you do. And if you're watching this, you're an FIU student, so you attend school. These are the things that are known and constant in your schedule. So when we talk about adopting um, new behaviors, new coping strategies, what I really want you to consider is how could you attach a new habit to one of these knowns? It is much easier in, in, instead of starting something brand new, starting a new ritual, um, starting a new pattern, it's much easier to attach something new to an established uh, routine for us. So for example, in the morning when I brush my teeth, I'm doing this every morning. So as I'm brushing my teeth, instead of maybe just facing out, I'm going to use that time to engage in some positive self-talk. Okay, so instead of letting the worries of the day ahead of me start to filter through my mind, I can choose to add to this already existing time something that's going to be positive and beneficial for me. So maybe I practice positive self-talk and affirmations. And maybe I say kind things to myself, like, you've got this. You're going to tackle this day. Just keep breathing. Focus on what you can do and then release the rest of it. You're not aiming for perfection. Just kind of reminders to myself that I can do simultaneously while I'm brushing my teeth. Or what are some other things? Maybe while you shower, you want to pop in a podcast that's really relaxing for you or play some music that you love. Right. So you're kind of doing the mundane. You're doing the activity that you're going to do anyways. And what could you do to add to it when you're eating? Could you practice some mindful eating? Could you really stop and breathe and pay attention to what you're eating? Notice the texture of the food. Notice the taste of the food, the smell. Notice how you're feeling. Right. Using something that you're doing every day to really elevate and enhance and to bring down your levels of stress. And that's going to be unique for all of us. So these are just suggestions, but think about the things that you do every day. And then what could you attach to those everyday occurrences that's going to add value, add to your bucket while also decreasing stress? So I know for individuals that I've talked to in the past around stress, they'll often talk about how commuting uh, in our city can be very stress provoking until they find something enjoyable to do with that time. So for some individuals, they do mindful driving. They notice the things around them that they hadn't noticed before. They go with the windows down when it's not too hot so they can feel the wind. They are very aware of the vibration of the car. They're just using that as a mindfulness moment. Or for others, they're queuing in podcasts that they love to listen to. They're listening to audiobooks. They're using that time to replay parts of their, their material that they need to study for so that they feel as though they're equipping themselves. So what are the things that you're doing that you can add to? That's a little bit of time management, okay? 
Now, for some of us, we fall into the trap of um, kind of overspending, which means we might have an hour block and we kind of cram in 20 things that we think we can get done in that hour, which for most of us is unrealistic. And we tend to um, cram or crowd our time, leaving very little margin. And what we know is that in that hour, other things are gonna be popping up that we weren't anticipating. You're gonna get a call you have to take. You're gonna remember that you have to send an email. Something is gonna pop up that you weren't anticipating and it's allowing for some margin in your day not booking things so tightly, not creating a schedule where there's no room for you to breathe so that when these spontaneous kind of unplanned things happen, they're not causing stress because you have some additional time. We know that distractions um, can be really hard to manage time. So things like email and social media, um, you get to control how often you're alerted, how often you engage. So maybe you silence notifications um, on your devices. Did you hear that? That was my email notification. I think the timing is awesome <laughs> because it's a distraction, right? I'm here with you, we're having a conversation and then that pops up. And so what ends up happening is now my brain wants to tell me you have to look at that as opposed to silencing notifications. And then what ends up happening is now we can focus on what's in front of us and we get to choose when we have the time and how frequently we need to visit these sites. Um, meetings, depending on what your schedule is and what your flexibility is, sometimes scheduling meetings back to back helps because it's this kind of confined time of meeting with individuals. Now I wouldn't recommend doing that for four or five hours at a time because that's very draining and it's not allowing any time for yourself. But if you know that you're gonna to have to meet with the classmate and that's gonna be about a half an hour, and then you wanna talk with the professor, that may be another half an hour, and you need to attend this Zoom conference, that's gonna be an hour. Well, that's two hours right there and then, but if you can somehow kind of pack it all around together, you're not having to stop studying, stop working, to check in on a meeting, to check in on a webinar, and then try to go back to it. So just try to bundle um, your meetings. Interruptions, obviously interruptions, not just from our devices, but other interruptions. Interruptions with well-meaning people who wanna find out how we're doing and check in on us, friends, family, coworkers. Um, this is where you figuring out spaces where you can have privacy, putting a sign on your door, um, not available for the next hour, just kind of letting the people around you know that you're really in a time of focused concentration. Okay, so communicating your needs around not being interrupted. And then procrastination. You wanna reflect on why am I procrastinating? What are some reasons? Maybe I'm so overwhelmed, I don't know where to begin. Maybe I'm just not engaged in this work. It bores me, I'm not interested in it. What do most people like to do? We like to spend time in the things that are interesting to us, that we enjoy, that are exciting to us. And so we'll sometimes avoid and move away from the things that are not um, in line with our interest, but we still have to get them done. Sometimes we procrastinate because we're worried we're not gonna do a good job. And that actually is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because the longer that we procrastinate, oftentimes we're giving ourselves um, less than a best chance of doing our best. And then the bottom line truth is maybe you'd rather be doing something else. So we put off the thing we don't wanna do in favor or in service of the thing that we do. So what are some suggestions? Well, Schrager and Sadowski, which is where this article and this information came from, suggested that there's some ways that maybe you can overcome procrastination, okay? And you'll notice here that they say, maybe you break down bigger projects into smaller ones. Okay, so instead of like setting aside a whole day to tackle a whole project, maybe you start a week earlier but you tackle smaller um, tasks in order to get to that final project. They suggest using the 10 minute rule, do something just for 10 minutes to get started. We can find 10 minutes in our day to do anything. So if there's something that you don't like, that you wanna avoid, just commit to 10 minutes. Because what typically happens is once we started for 10 minutes, guess what we end up doing? We end up staying in it. 
So maybe you're somebody who's like, oh, I don't love to exercise, but I always feel better after I do it. Well, maybe for you, just committing to 10 minutes is what you need. And then you start. And then when you're 10 minutes in, you're thinking, well, I'm already here. I'm already in this. Might as well just go for another 10 minutes. And then 10 minutes turns into 20 and 20 turns into 30 and you get the picture. Okay. And then there's something to be said for asking for help. We all have strengths and we all have areas that um, come harder for us, right? They don't come as easy or as naturally. Those are the places where we can really access our resources and ask for help. So delegate, bring people in who can support you and assist you, uh, especially when you're experiencing higher levels of stress. And then lastly, around procrastination, incentivize yourself, right? Tell yourself you're going to get rewarded once you complete something. So once I finish this paper, I'm going to binge this Netflix series, okay, or whatever it is. Um, once I finish this project, um, I'm going to go to sleep early. Once I finish this assignment, um, I'm going to go hang out with friends, okay? And if you can pair the project, the assignment, the thing that has to get done with a positive, with a reward, then there's a really nice correlation to getting the work done so that I can get to the thing that I really enjoy. And then for those of you out there who are perfectionists, I am a recovering perfectionist and sometimes I return to my perfectionistic ways. But this can also um, really distract us from being able to get work done. It can distract us from being really happy with who we are as people. So if you can give yourself permission that the work doesn't have to be perfect, even if you're used to getting straight A's, 4.0 student, um, does it have to be a 4.0 all the time? And then we also know that sometimes our perfectionism, because we want things to be perfect, sometimes it takes us longer to get things done, longer to get started on things, and certainly longer to finish. So for those of you um, that can relate, sometimes even answering an email for you, which should take one minute, takes you 10 minutes or 20 minutes because you're sitting there having to write the perfect email and thinking about your word choice and rereading the email and changing it. And that email could have, should have been sent a minute within a minute. Okay, so where are the places where you're willing to release and give up a little bit of perfectionism? Okay, and then lastly, don't dwell on your mistakes. Right, we learn from them, we move on. Um, believe it or not, we spend a lot of wasted time um, focusing on kind of our deficits and too few uh, time spending on our um, assets and what we do well. So you would do well if you shifted that and you focus much more on your strengths and on what you're doing well rather than focusing on what you're not doing well. All right, the second area for action-oriented Stress management is thoughts, managing our thoughts. So the idea here is that we're supposed to mind our mind. In other words, we need to manage our minds. We need to manage our thoughts. Otherwise, they manage us. And we can get quite sick, quite discouraged, quite down when our thoughts are not um, working for us. So there's a concept here called the thought trap. And we all can be subject to this trap. And some of us find ourselves in this trap quite a bit, which is you'll have an intrusive thought of, oh, that test is due at the end of the week. And now all of a sudden your thoughts start to multiply. So the intrusive thought, oh, you weren't hoping to think about that thought, but it showed up. And now that thought has led to a multitude of other thoughts. What if I don't pass this exam? I'm going to fail this class. If I fail this class, I won't be able to move ahead in the program. My graduation will be delayed. I won't be able to apply for grad schools or PhD programs. <gasps> now you are in a spiral. And literally the thought started with, I have an exam by the end of the week. So it's really important that you catch these thoughts early on and that they don't occupy um, not only more of your headspace, right? But also that you are able to kind of recognize, how is this thought helping me? Is this thought helping me or hurting me? And if the thought is helping you, then great. That's wonderful. Allow that to help you and move you to a place of reduced stress. But if the thought is hurting, then release the thought and stop it and replace it with a helpful thought. 
So instead of if I fail this exam by the end of the week, I'm going to have to drop this class or I'm going to fail out of this class and my program. That's not helpful. What's helpful is I have an exam at the end of the week. What can I do to best prepare and to give myself the best chance for success? Okay, that's how you kind of shift the thought. You catch it. There's the thought and then you shift it so it doesn't spiral you and lead you to this dark place of um, a failure and of disappointment. And then lastly, people management. Well, how can we manage people? Well, here's what we can do. We have to be really honest about those individuals in our lives that, um, that really bring, um, bring us peace, that really add value to us, that we seek out their support. Um, we seek out their friendship, uh, their time, because we're just better for it. Um, and this can be friends, family, coworker. This can be anybody. Um, these are the people that you want to be able to have more experiences with. Really go after and pursue those relationships. And then sometimes there are individuals in our lives who deplete us, who might be a bit more demanding, who might be struggling with their own issues and don't realize it, but they're kind of compounding our issues with their issues. And we don't want to be insensitive. We're not trying to cut off relationships. Instead, what we're saying is, maybe I just need to manage how much of my time I'm able to give in a way that's healthy for me, but also supportive and caring towards them. So sometimes these are even family members. You love them. You wouldn't want them to be, you know, in anybody else's family. But, you know, maybe for this week when you've got a lot going on, you kind of just need to put them on notice. I've got a big week ahead. I'm not going to be able to spend as much time talking or hanging out or supporting you. And be real clear about that, um, what your needs are as well, and be able to speak your needs to other people. All right. How you doing? You holding up? I hope that you're getting some helpful tips from this. Maybe it's even leading you to your own thoughts, things that I'm not bringing up, but things that are reminders for you or you're having your own uh, aha moments or moments of awareness. Um, I'm hoping that this is just helpful for you in any way. So how do we now focus on the acceptance oriented work? Remember acceptance oriented work comes from the things that we really cannot change. So like deadlines that are imposed upon us. A professor sets a deadline, you have to meet that deadline. So since you can't change it, you have to accept it. And what are the things you can do um, to kind of support acceptance? And okay. well, one of the things we can do is we can help our bodies out by moving. So many of us are sitting, studying, sitting, working, sitting, watching TV. We're kind of in a very sedentary space um, and not using our bodies. And so what happens often is that these kind of stress chemicals, these toxins, kind of just get trapped in our body. And there's a saying in trauma work, I, I do um, trauma counseling um, as a therapist, and something that we often kind of tell clients is we carry our issues in our tissues. Our tissues literally meaning our cells and the very makeup, physical makeup of who we are. We literally carry that in our bodies. We carry the things that stress us out, that overwhelm us. We carry our issues in our tissues. And so one of the things we can do to kind of move some of this, um, some of these toxins around is literally get moving. And notice I didn't say exercise, although that's great if that's what you prefer. But for so many people, when they hear the word exercise, they connect it to performance-based. So they connect it to have to work out for three to five times a week for this amount of time in order for me to be successful. That's fine if that's what you want to do, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about movement. We're literally talking about stretching throughout the day, moving your body. So normally we sit hunched over all day. We're sitting like this around screens or sitting, you know, kind of hunched in um, at our desks and opening up our bodies, like throwing your shoulders back. I don't know if you can see me here, but opening up our arms wide throwing back our head, what we're doing is we're kind of creating a posture of openness. We're letting our body open up, okay, to the moment, to the experiences. Instead of being closed off and contained, 
We're using movement to just kind of awaken us. And we should be moving often. If you sit a lot, alternate it with standing. Walk, walk around your office, walk around your room, walk down the hall, wherever you are, use walking um, as a powerful tool for movement. It doesn't cost any money. It doesn't cost you any, um, any time because you could even still be talking on the phone while you move. Some of us can still be answering uh, text messages or emails while you move, although please be careful if you're out in public. I don't want you to walk and trip or walk and get hurt. So just be mindful of your awareness uh, of your surroundings. Um, but if you can, just move, stretch, bend over, touch your toes while you're sitting in your seat. There's some great apps, free apps that you could find on your phone or you can find on any device that can guide you in chair stretching. There are great apps that can help you with, um, and this kind of goes into the physical relaxation, that can guide you in meditation and in breathing, in thinking spaces. There are also um, organization apps. So when we were talking about managing your calendar, you can also find an app to help you organize that. So there are really some wonderful free tools out there to help you to help remind you the importance of moving, how you can move, how you can stretch, how you can use your body um, for good in managing stress, rather than just let your body absorb all the negativity of stress, okay? And then of course, sleep is very important. Sleep hygiene matters. Um, if you're somebody who struggles with sleep, as so many of us do going through the university and having to study and read and do projects late at night, um, oftentimes sleep is one of the things that we are, um, we feel that we can give up and yet your sleep is something that we want to protect. Okay. That's where we are restored. That's where we get to shut off. That's where we don't have to live in a hyper aroused state. Um, so sleep is critically important to our overall functioning, our intellectual capacity, our emotional well-being, and in our overall ability to, um, to decompress, okay? Um, physical relaxation, whatever that means for you. So again, for some of you that might be um, playing with a pet, playing with a child. For others of you, this might look like going for a drive, um, just lighting a candle and laying down, whatever this looks like for you. How do you engage in physical relaxation? What is physically relaxing for you? And then use this in those times where you don't have a lot of um, opportunity or impact to change the situation. So instead you're going to accept it and you're gonna utilize physical relaxation and movement and sleep to kind of help to restore, repair, to refresh, and to be in a space where you're gonna be able to um, accept whatever the situation is. So here are some examples and why it's so important that we kind of do these acceptance-based um, activities. Okay, so if you're somebody that thinks, I'm not good at meditating, I've tried, that's okay. In fact, the heart of meditation says we don't judge our ability to focus, our ability to meditate, our ability to breathe. Um, we just get in there and do it to the best of our ability. So you don't have to do regu regulated breathing, like count to five and hold. Um, you can do any breathing that uh, is meaningful for you. You can put your hand over your chest and you can take deep breaths in. And just imagine that you're kind of feeling your heart space with some good fresh air or you can lower your hands and you can place them on your belly and you can do deeper diaphragmatic breathing, um, which really requires you to breathe more deeply, hold into the breath a little bit longer, okay? But move at your own pace, move at your own comfort. Again, there are some great breathing apps um, that maybe you wanna check out and give it a try. And again, if you pair this with an activity that you're already doing, if you learn to breathe, um, in the shower, or you learn to breathe as you're preparing your meals, um, you're now having the double benefit of getting something done, meal prepping with breathing, okay? 
And this is an activity that um, I would encourage you to engage in. You can just draw um, on a sheet of paper, a shield, or you can visualize the shield and just write on a piece of paper. But this activity is really just to get you thinking about how can you um, incorporate activities, coping skills, new and existing ways of combating stress in your life. And then add as many things in here as you can, um, things that you're already doing and new things. And then keep this in a very prominent place. Put this in your room, keep this in your car, maybe attach it to your computer screen. Um, put this somewhere so that you can be reminded of taking active steps daily and often on being able to combat stress. Stress isn't going anywhere. Stressors are a part of life. And so what's important is that we are actively engaging in protecting ourselves um, from the things that stress us. And that's how we shift from being kind of a victim of stress to somebody who can really manage stress well and even use stress to our benefit. So take time, engage in this activity, write the names of people who are supportive and helpful that you could reach out to, write the activities that are helpful for you. Um, go ahead and write how you can best use your time, anything that's going to support you in your goal for stress reduction. Go ahead and, and write it down and kind of memorize this as your stress shield. And if you're listening to this and you're thinking, some of this I know, um, most of this I know, I just can't seem to do this. I'm really in a stuck place. I'm not doing great. Um, I feel like what I need is beyond what this workshop is offering me. Then there are places that can help and you have to reach out to them. So, and by you have to, it's not an order, it's rather an act of kindness towards yourself. Um, when we need help, we should seek help for ourselves. And so we have the CAPS, which is the counseling center here on campus. Um, they're wonderful in supporting students. They have groups and they have resources for you to help you with anxiety and stress and depression and preparing during exam times. So really use that, that's a wonderful resource that um, students have available to them. And then there are also other resources. Reach out to a counselor, reach out to a helpline. 211 is a great helpline. If you dial 211 on your phone and you say, look, I really need a support group because I'm feeling depressed or I need a counselor, they'll help connect you with somebody. Um, so you've got resources here on campus. You've got the CAP Center. And you've got resources off campus through 211, um, which is a helpline available. So if this is you, then provide the help that you need to yourself. And if there's anything that I can do to support you, I am here on campus. I'm accessible to you. This is my email address, vgray at fiu.edu. I'm happy to continue the conversation. If you're somebody who has a particular question or you want to talk a little more in detail about something maybe that I brought up or something that you thought of while um, engaging in this webinar, then please reach out to me. I'm really happy to connect with students and it would be a joy to be able to connect with you. So if I can be of any support or service or information to you, please reach out. With that said, um, I wish you all the best this semester. I hope that you are able to manage your stress more successfully, encourage others around you to do the same. Maybe we all can kind of link arms and help each other manage stress. So I wish you well, and thank you so much for spending this time.